Hi, I'm Michael Keating, and welcome to the next chapter. Today, we're going to explore the world of being an author and what it takes to actually be an author. So stick around after the Pit, uh, Forge Fit commercial, and we'll be right back. Ready? I am Forge Fit. I'm becoming Forge Fit. I am Forge Fit. I am Forge Fit. I am Forge Fit. I'm Forge Fit. We are Forge Fit! Hi, welcome back, and thanks again to Forge Fitness for sponsoring our show. We're here with uh, Thomas Taylor. Now, you're actually the husband of Elise. We've had Elise on another show here. Uh, and you're also an author and a musician and a artist and... Well, not quite a musician. That's a story in itself. I, I have uh, written some songs, but uh -huh. uh, she's the uh, pro at that. I'm just sort of dabbling in that area. But uh, mostly I, I do uh, uh, artwork and... Uh, my favorite thing to do here uh, is writing. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen, and this isn't even all of the stuff you have. No, nope, it's not just at all. A, a, just a small portion of it, actually. Yeah, actually, I write not only under my name, but under a bunch of pen names, and I don't want to uh, let anybody know who they are. I'm in the middle of an experiment right now. I want to find out who becomes more successful in the end of my career. Is it going to be me, or is it going to be my pen names? Well, there so, you go. Yeah, yeah. And yet that, yeah, that Grisham name is great, by the way. You know, <laughs> Thank you very much. That. And that, well, first of all, uh, you're, you're so different than Elise. And yeah. that, I mean, I, you guys are like polar opposites. You know, she has the Missy Barrett books, and you have horror stories, and you have also mystery books. Yes. And that, uh, tell us a little bit about your books, first of all. I mean, the ones you currently have out. Well, the ones that I currently have out are mostly horror books. I do have some science fiction stories and some mainstream stories as mm -hmm. well, Cloak and Dagger. But uh, I like horror the best. Um, I am not your typical. Uh, gratuitous gore and violence kind of person. Though. That's what I like about your books. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of think that uh, that horror is it can be used as a moral tale in a way. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you think about it, you know, life is very scary to begin with, and uh, sometimes people tend to get themselves into trouble. Um, by uh, dabbling in things that they shouldn't. And so the moral of my stories is always, um, if you truck with the devil, the devil is what you're gonna get. Or if you seek trouble, you, you, know, you will find it. And that's not always a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not preachy in my books, but you know, that's what you, when you get to the end of a story, that's pretty much what well, you Well, you have a little with. lesson, again, like your wife, you have a lesson in each book. Yeah. I mean, you, you learn something. By the end of the book, you learn something, which yeah. is very cool. And that end, uh, to me, it's very, very interesting because really people just put in, like ordinary people put into impossible situations. It's yeah, not like yeah. these are evil people put in a situation. These are people that are 
Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of one story, uh, uh -huh. and I won't take up a lot of time with this, but there is a story that I, that I, that I have in there called the Cobalt Experiments, which mm -hmm. I feel is, is, is actually pretty typical um, uh, of, of uh, a representative of the way that teenagers think and act. And I, you know, as a teenager, we, you all go through this terrible age where we go through ma uh, our maturity and, yeah. and, and we get kind of anxious, but we also get kind of mean towards our parents. And in this story, what happens is, is that there's this brilliant... Uh, uh, kid and and he's smarter than anybody else. He's got mm -hmm. a super high IQ, and he's got a bunch of chemistry sets that he's cobbled together, and he's created an experiment, and uh, he's designing the better widget. But uh, in the course of this, um, he gets blown into into another universe. Now, before this happens, though, he's very mean towards his parents. He mm -hmm. thinks that his parents are not intelligent, and and they limit him too much. Uh, they're overprotective and that kind of thing. Well, when he gets into this new universe, what he discovers is is that uh, he's stuck there and there's monsters that are coming to get him. And he has to recreate this, exper uh, this experiment to get back where he came from. But instead, he blows himself into a third universe. And in that universe, uh, he is the one who is unintelligent. His parents are brilliant. And even though he has an IQ that is off the charts by our measure, mm -hmm. uh, for him, he is at the bottom of the class and they're thinking of sending him to reform school aside from that because of his behavior. Wow. And worse yet, he in this universe, there are no chemicals uh, that he can use to get back to his original universe, so he's stuck there. And um, in reality, in real life, we kind of find ourselves in a similar situation. We experiment with things that probably are not in our best interest to experiment with, yeah. and we wind up in a lot of trouble. So. Well, a lot of people do. Yes, <laughs> a lot of people do. Sometimes it. we can't extract ourselves from that trouble ourselves. We have to rely on other people yeah. to do it. So, so what, what's the name of that book? Uh, well, that was a short story called the Cobalt Experiment, and that was in um, uh, Spectral Septet, which I don't know if the camera's looking at that oh, yeah, or not. It's looking right there. So I'm plugging my book on TV. So, well, there you are. That's that's what you're supposed to do on these things. <laughs> yeah, and that. So uh, let's go back to to when you were a kid. Now, this is the thing that actually absolutely fascinates me and actually is really what the show is all about. We're all about the mind, body, spirit and actually what it takes to become more. And you started off early, early, I mean as a kid, writing stories. Well, I think, I think my success, um, mm -hmm. as hackneyed as it sounds, really I owe it to my mother and father because my, my mother and father liked to read to me very much when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And before I even went into preschool I could already read books. And uh, whereas other kids may have been reading stuff like Dr. Seuss and that, I was already trying to progress uh, to books of a higher order, such as Hardy Boy books and mm -hmm. stuff like that, even though Hardy Boy books are really meant for the 8 to 12 year old range. Yeah. I was trying to read these things in, in, in preschool. And uh, I wasn't completely understanding everything that I was reading because some of the words were really big and that sort of thing. But at some point, uh, I, I thought to myself that I would like to tell my own stories. I understood that with, with um, books, they were actually very powerful things. Somebody who you never met could type something out on a, on a, on a typewriter. Yeah. They could send it to a publisher, and the publisher would publish it. Somebody else would pick it up and read it, and they would understand what this person who they had never met was trying to tell you. And I thought, well, I want to do that because I have a lot to say. And so what I did was I started to write my own stories. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, the first stories that I used to write were on my mother's uh, IBM Selectric typewriter. Yeah. It was an electric <laughs> typewriter. And uh, I was just plugging away, and I thought it was fun to just, you know, hit those keys and, and hear it make the clackety-clack sound and all that kind of thing. Yeah, for and those I, of you out there that don't know this, this was pre-computer. Yeah, yes, <laughs> I mean, pre-computer. When people actually it's, did all some this. Some kids will never know yeah, what, it's what like a... Yeah, uh, dial phones. They yes. just don't know about it. Yeah, they won't be able to even figure out how to use it. They'll look at it, and they'll say, well, this is weird. But, Where, where's uh, the screen? You know, there's no screen on this thing. Exactly. But I used to do stuff like write uh, Little House on the Prairie books and and uh, um, um, and and stuff and and stories about the Waltons and those kinds of things because those were my favorite shows. And yeah. I also had this terrible crush on Melissa Gilbert and Melissa Sue Anderson from Little House on the Prairie. And uh, I also had this crush on Mary McDonough from the Waltons. Now, I know your tech guy has a picture of me with uh, Mary McDonough holding up one of my books. It was like a, a dream come true. <laughs> She's holding one of my books, you know, well, there uh, you go. not knowing that I, that I had a crush on her. But anyway, I used to write these stories, and, and, uh -huh. and um, I still have a few. The rest, if anybody wants any of these stories, they can you know, go searching uh, in any one of the Chicagoland area's dumps, and they're bound to find them <laughs> sooner or later. And Are any of these on your websites and stuff? <coughs> well, no, not those. Um, and uh, they're, they're just um, 
too embarrassing for me to want to put oh, up. That would be fun, but, though. That would be very interesting to me, <coughs> actually. Read, but. but I have done things that I do regard as remarkable, and one of the things that I did do was, was this, and uh, I decided that I was going to write my own horror story. Mm -hmm. our, our Hardy Boy story. We're getting ahead of ourselves as far as horror stories go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It could be a horror story. You just haven't seen my writing. <laughs> and the thing about this is, is that I, I began to read Hardy Boy stories and really enjoy them. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, geez, if I if I write a a Hardy Boy story, uh, I can just send this off to Grosset and Dunlap, and they're going to publish this thing and 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 all that. And no questions, no question about it. It'll just come across the desk of the editor, and they'll say we have to publish this. And I just knew that that now, would how happen. How old were you at this time? Oh, I don't remember. I think I think this probably I was around eight or nine or so. Okay. And and I did a couple of these. At any rate, by the time I finished them, I discovered that Gross and public uh, Gross and Dunlip had gotten bought out by somebody else. So yeah, this was no longer an opportunity. But I I never. But they would have taken it in the heartbeat writing. if you said it. Yeah. And I was inspired by all kinds of other things as well. I had a very active imagination. And so, um, uh, you know, when my parents first took us to Disneyland and Disney mm -hmm. World when we were kids, I had a sister. So they took us down there, and, and we would take rides on the Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion and those kinds of things. And I thought, well, I ought to write some stories of my own based on these. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, what happened, though, was I thought, well, you know, I don't have to copy what everybody else writes. I, mm -hmm. should, I should start writing stuff for myself. And uh, that's where I really began to to diverge, and and and. And that I was think, at what age? Yes, and so getting back to your original point, um, mm -hmm. that is the way that anybody should go about embarking on on their career, no matter what it is. Um, I would say, you know, begin by reading what others have have. If you're going to be a writer, for mm -hmm. example, read as much as you can. Learn what what's out there. Learn what's already been published. Uh, yeah, yeah. Get an idea about how people write, and then you'll get an idea about and how you want to write. And everything else that goes into writing. Exactly. Yeah. And then write. Write as much as you 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 can. And it doesn't matter whether it's good or not. Uh, um, just write for the sake of writing because you are honing that craft. And then submit, submit, submit. Yeah, that's, that was my next thing to say. Is you you've got to submit stuff. Exactly, and it doesn't matter whether or not what you've submitted is good or not. You're getting an idea about what publishers want, what editors look at, um, and and that kind of thing. You're getting an idea about what it, what the the whole yeah. publishing uh, field looks like. And bottom line, if you get rejected, well, I, well, you've gotten rejected by the best. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> you have. Let's let's talk about that for a second. Well, I wow. can tell you when I was a kid. Uh, well, actually, not when I was a kid, but uh, around uh, high school, mm -hmm. I started keeping track of uh, some of the stuff that I had submitted. And uh, I kept a ledger here. This is actually my, my grandmother's old ledger. I think we dropped the mic, didn't we? You did drop the mic. Here, <laughs> let me set that up for you. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, speak into the mic. Okay, well, this is actually my grandmother's old ledger. And uh, on this, uh, she, didn't, she didn't have anything uh, written in here, so I commandeered it. There you go. And uh, what I did was, is I um, wrote in here uh, the names of the stories, when I wrote them. Again, you're, you're getting that. Oh, put the side there. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. I wrote in here uh, the names of the stories, when I wrote them, when I submitted them, to which uh, publishers they were submitted, and whether or not they were accepted or rejected. And uh, so that's another thing you got to do, is you gotta, you got to be persistent. Um, when, when you're when you're embarking on your career, uh -huh. uh, especially with with a writing career, um, I think it's amazing that you actually kept a log of that. And you were in high school, you said at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that, high that's very, very, very bright. That's, yeah, you know, and, and, and very necessary. And uh, I also believe that you have to be audacious with your attempts to do things. Um, one of the things that I decided to do when I was a kid was I'm going to write for Doctor Who. This was the original classic series. I lost my microphone. <laughs> Well, I'll continue. I'll commandeer the show. Hello. <laughs> Michael Keating can't be with Golly. us here today. So you wrote for Doctor Who. Well, I tried to write for Doctor Who. That's a story in itself, and that's an interesting one uh, from the perspective, I think, of the fan base. Uh, this was the classic series. They have a new series right now, which is... Which yeah, is, with, uh, with the lady in it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, before that, they had a couple of newer doctors, but the show had disappeared for a while. Uh, anyway, I was an avid fan of the show, once again, because of my active imagination. I liked mm -hmm. the concept that there was a, a, a person who could travel around the universe and find new adventures wherever he went. I mean, this is a lot uh, like what I do with my books, you know. 
So um, anyway, I decided I was going to write a script and submit it to Doctor Who. Now, I knew nothing about script writing or anything else, and what it turned out to be was just a story idea. Mm -hmm. But I went to a Doctor Who convention, and uh, producer Jonathan Nathan Turner was there. And in these conventions, as you may know, um, uh, the producer and a bunch of other actors sit at a bunch of tables. Do the panel. There's an audience yeah. there, and uh, you can go up and you can ask questions. And so I went up there and I asked a question. Everybody else was asking, what's going to be on next season, or yeah. you know that kind of thing. And I said, I put them on the spot. Um, I said, do you accept scripts and story ideas from uh, unsolicited, or you know, unsolicited scripts from, from authors you don't know? And he said, no. Now again, you were in high school at this point. Yes, I was. Which is uh, highly unusual for a high school student to even think about that. Yes, but on the other hand, I figured, I, I had already done my research. I had uh -huh. read Doctor Who magazine in which he said it, it is really, uh, almost impossible to accept anything from an unsolicited author. They don't have any idea about how a show works, they don't have any idea mm -hmm. about uh, you know, uh, where the cameras have to be and how much it costs to build these well, sets. Well, plus there's lawsuits and everything else that come into that. If, if, exactly. Uh, if, they, if they even read something that you wrote and it's similar to something they already have, yep. there's trouble. That's exactly yeah, the case. Uh, we've, I've been through that again and again and again. But nevertheless, I decided, okay, if, if there's going to be a way that he's going to look at this thing, I'm going to have to, to railroad him into it. And that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I said, would you accept? So first I asked him, I said, uh, would you accept any scripts from unsolicited, or unsolicited scripts from, from authors you don't know? And he said, no. And I said, would you, would you uh, accept mine? Well, there's a whole audience there of two or 300 people. Yeah. He's not going to say no, and he took it. And I and I said, uh, it, you know, to myself, I said, well, you know, this thing's never going to be looked at anyway, because what I what I knew from reading in Doctor Who magazine is that these things wind up on top of a file cabinet or in a file cabinet or in the circular file. More so than you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you see, uh, this was a good experience all around because even though I did get rejected, I knew I knew I would get rejected. In the mail comes this envelope from the BBC. Yeah. And of course, uh, on the screen, probably what will happen is they'll put up the rejection letter. And, and it was from John Nathan Turner, and he said, thank you for your story idea. We are fully commissioned at the moment. And included with that was a little uh, note about what was going to be happening next season on the show. Mm -hmm. And that season, the show went on hiatus for 18 months. The BBC had actually canned the show, and they were debating about whether or not to bring it right back. back yeah. So what I have... Uh, as a result of that experience is uh, a piece of paper that says what was supposed to be on that show uh, mm. for the upcoming season. Nobody else knows what it is. I'm the only one in the world who actually has this. So, uh, And it's, uh, for Doctor Who fans, that's a huge thing. It I mean, is. A, it is. Any and of I, this is a huge thing for them. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not talking about that experience to, dra to brag about it. What yeah, I yeah. am saying is, is, that, is that if you don't try to do these kinds of things, if you don't put your your foot out there and take the first step, mm -hmm. you're you're you know you won't you won't get to where you want to be in the future. Yeah. And where I wanted to be in the future is where I am right now, which is you know publishing books and yeah. doing artwork and things and getting commissioned for that. So. And publishing a lot of books. I mean, you publish yeah. a lot of stuff. Now, first of all, I want to go back again to this the BBC thing. You call it a rejection letter, but I've read it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a rejection letter in any way, shape, or form. It says that they're fully commissioned at the moment, but that they thought your ideas were wonderful, and uh, uh, they, it's very encouraging. The yes, letter they sent you, it's not, I mean, I've gotten rejection letters, and they're not encouraging. <laughs> Usually they say, you know, you're, you're lousy, you get out of the business, yep. uh, you know, and at least the things I've gotten. So. Well, you know, uh, I liked to uh, think about that letter sometimes when there's mm -hmm. other authors who are saying, how do I get started in the business? Because, uh, you know, uh, at the time, John Nathan Turner is, is, is writing to a high school kid, yeah. you know, and, and, and he is trying to be very inspirational for that kid. And, and uh, so he was. And so I like to tell, you know, uh, kids or aspiring writers, you know, uh, I like, first of all, I like to reflect upon the fact that somebody tried to give me a boost and somebody tried to give me encouragement, and then I try to give that to them. So, and, you know, that's the value of that letter to me. It, it, in that sense, it's not a rejection letter at all. It's a letter of encouragement. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's a big deal because uh, he's huge. I mean, he was yeah. absolutely huge, especially then. He was absolutely huge, like a, Mike, a Mark Burnett would be now or a Elon Musk would be now. Right. For somebody to spend five minutes or ten minutes out of their day yep. is phenomenal. And, and the I, fact that he did that to you. And, and what I'm told is, is that he didn't even have a personal secretary. So... I think, I'm, I think I'm still straight. I think yeah. you're good if you just put your arm around this way. Okay. There you go. All right. 
So yeah, he didn't even have a personal secretary, so it's likely that he that he typed that himself too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's very, very cool, and that's very, very cool. Okay, now, let's go a little bit about it. If somebody out there actually wants to become an uh, author, mm -hmm. and that, I mean, we certainly go into how you go about doing art as well, but if there's somebody wants to become an author, what are the steps? Do you keep a journal? Do you keep a nightly run? Do you get up in the morning? I know from, from personal experience with you that you actually have a block of time put out. You say, by January 1st, we have this. By February 2nd, yep. we have that. Uh, we did a thing on goal setting not too long ago, and this this falls exactly into goal setting. Yep. You actually you you put times and dates, and exactly what you want to accomplish by this amount of time. Yep. And that to me is really important, and something we need to get out there. I, I think the important thing is 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 to uh, take. Uh, First of all, yes, you do need to keep a journal. Mm -hmm. I, I always keep one uh, sitting by my bedside, uh, or I did throughout most of my life, and I would wake up in the middle of the night with these kinds of ideas and write them down. Now, sometimes uh, when you get up first thing in the morning, you don't know what you've written. You can't read it. It's, it's impossible. Um, but, uh, but most of the time you can, and sometimes those ideas are really good ones and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to take those and try to develop them as much as possible. You also have to remember to make time to write. Now, uh, over the course of my life, I wasn't just writing and wasn't just doing artwork. I was always doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got older, I was doing a lot of lawn jobs. In fact, I like to think that I had my own lawn cutting business. I had six or seven clients at any given wow. time and was trimming trees and that kind of stuff and bushes. And uh, I also worked a, in a trophy shop as a kid for minimum wage, earning three thirty-five an hour. Uh, as an adult, uh, I've been a janitor. I've, I've um, yeah. uh, been a courier, a bookkeeper, and, and uh, worked for a consulting firm for not-for-profits as a personal assistant to the vice president. But all of that time, uh, yeah. I managed to set aside time to write. And that's the key thing, it, um, is, is setting aside that time. You, you sit there, you don't have any other distractions, and you focus and you write. That's, that's important. Now, I hate to say it, we're at the end of the show right now, but uh, we need to have you back again because we haven't even begun to touch your artwork. Yep. And that we could talk again, we could talk for another two hours just like with your wife. And that, but uh, definitely, if you get a chance to, uh, if you're on Facebook, or if you see this on used to, uh, to YouTube, <laughs> definitely share this, uh, like it, let people know that you uh, enjoy the program. And uh, check into more of the uh, the books and stuff that Thomas writes here. Yeah, they're on they're on Amazon.com. Yeah, yeah Amazon.com, and that and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for being here. Bye bye, everybody. I am Forge Fit. I am Forge Fit. I'm Forge Fit. We are Forge Fit!